started uh, with uh, this uh, weather forecast example uh, in learning a Bayesian network. Huh? So this is a very simple algorithm um, which allows to do some learning, uh, even learning the structure of the Bayesian network. Huh? And we use this uh, weather forecast example where we do have training data and this is this is the distribution. Yeah, this is the full distribution, is it? Let's see. Two, four, six, eight. Yeah, eight values for three binary variables. And based on this distribution, the goal is to learn a network for our three variables. Yeah? And uh, so the idea of the algorithm is that <coughs> In principle, we try all Bayesian network structures. Huh? Yeah, and uh, I mean here on the slide, I only used two different structures, which I want to compare in order to see which one is the better one. Huh? And what does better mean? Better means, suppose I use this structure. And I mean, in this structure, there are independence assumptions. Which independence assumption do I have here in this uh, network? That sky is independent from bar. Yeah, these two variables are independent. Yeah. How about here? Here, prec is independent from sky given bar. So we have a conditional independence assumption. And so you see, both networks are simplifications of the distribution. Huh? And uh, either one of these networks is good if this independence assumption or this independence assumption holds or if it approximately holds. Yeah? But if, if it is extremely false, then <coughs> our, um, our prognostic quality of the network would be bad. Okay, now we compare these two networks and in principle we would, would of course have to compare all Bayesian networks on these three variables. And now what do we do? We, we, fill, so we fill in our CPTs for this network and for this network, and once we have them, then we can uh, reconstruct uh, our distribution, which of course, oh, which probably will not be exactly this distribution because of the independence assumptions we made. Yeah? And then uh, we compute the distance from our new, uh, between the new distribution and the old distribution. So PA is the distribution of network A, and P is the original one, and PB is that of network B. And if we take the Euclidean distance between the vectors, we get these results. Uh, and you can see that network A is better than network B. Okay, um, yes. We can, uh, we can also use the kullback liebler uh, divergence, which is a distance metric uh, for probability dis distribution, particularly made for probability distribution, because as you can see here, it's based on the entropy. Um, so it's uh, something like the um, the entropy measures the the information content of a distribution. So it's the difference in uh, kind of the difference in information content in the two distributions. Huh? Um, okay, and here we get these two results which are consistent with what we got up here. 
yes. Okay, yeah, and uh, now the problem is, yeah, let's go back to the example. The problem is if we look at all network structures, then um, these two network structures would not give us the best result. What would you guess? Which network would be even better? Yeah, if you would take a fully connected network, for example, if you would add such an arrow here, then it represents really the full distribution and there are no independent assumptions. Um, and we would actually reconstruct the original distribution and that would give us the best result. But maybe the result would be only a very little bit better than what we had here. Huh? Um, so maybe it would be 0 0.0028. And then we would actually prefer this network because it is simpler. Because of Occam's razor. So if I have two models with similar quality, then we prefer the simpler model. Huh? But this wouldn't come out of this algorithm because the algorithm uh, strictly looks if the fully connected network has a, a, a little bit better distance, then this would be the result. Okay, and now what we do is, yeah, the question is now, how can we modify our algorithm such that uh, simpler networks will be preferred? And this is done by means of a so-called regularization term. So this is, I guess this is not written in the book. This term is called regularization term. That's quite important because we will see such terms again later. Um, now, what do we have here? I mean, this is well known. This is our uh, kullback liebler uh, distance between the two distributions. And now what we, what we did before is um, we selected then uh, that uh, Bayesian network with the smallest kullback liebler divergence. So we minimized this distance. What we do now is we add a second term. We add as a second term the size of our network. Huh? And then we minimize the sum. And as you can immediately see, uh, now the size has some influence on the result. And um, how much influence the size of the network gets is determined by this weight uh, parameter W. Huh? So the, the smaller this weight is, the bigger is the influence of the network size. Yeah, and so now if we select our networks based on this formula, with an appropriately chosen W, then um, uh, we get a pref uh, preference of smaller networks. So that's, that's a method how we can avoid overfitting. And that's a very common method in many machine learning algorithms. And that's called regularization. Okay, um, yeah, the, the unfortunate point is that this W has to be fit manually. Okay, yeah, and now let's talk about search space. Here we have an example of a network with five uh, variables, and we have already seen there are something like almost uh, 30,000 um, acyclic directed graphs with five nodes. Um, and with, with more nodes, it's even worse. So we cannot do a full exhaustive search on all DAGs given the nodes. 
And so we, we must use some heuristic procedure. And the first point which, yeah, which actually um, kills the automatic algorithm. Oh, it doesn't kill, but it, uh, it's no longer automatic. What we do is we manually give a variable ordering. So our variables have numbers from 1 to 5. And uh, now we select the numbers of our variables such that we have a causal ordering. So the, the, the root cause is uh, V1, then we have V2, V3, V4, and V5. And as we, uh, as we already have seen in the manual construction of Bayesian networks, uh, first thing is to give a variable ordering, and then we start adding edges, uh, directed edges, which always point from a, uh, only point from lower index to higher index. Uh, and this, of course, reduces uh, the number of possible directed graphs. Yeah, okay. And now what we do is we start with the fully connected network, which is here. So for five, for five variables, this is the fully connected directed acyclic graph, um, which respects our variable ordering. So you see from V1, we have four outgoing edges. Uh, from V2, we have three outgoing edges. Uh, from V3, we have two outgoing edges. From V4, one, and from V5, uh, none. Okay, so this is the, the fully connected network. Yeah, uh, and we, uh, we start, uh, yeah, we start removing edges in this network um, and look at our um, evaluation function here. Um, and now the distance, now watch the distance between the new distribution and the original distribution will increase. Let me see. Yeah, so we will, we will, we start removing edges, uh, greedily. We will greedily remove edges until the distance to the um, original distribution starts increasing. I mean, we would, uh, we would allow a little bit increasing, but if it, uh, if the increase is above a certain threshold, we would stop removing edges. Yeah, and this is a heuristic algorithm which is efficient. Yeah? First, we start with this fully connected network um, and we, we have the variable ordering. And second, because we do a greedy removal of edges, the complexity is linear in the number of edges and that's tractable. Yeah. Okay, yeah remove edges until f is not decreasing anymore. Huh? Or maybe th this is a little bit too strong. Uh, until um, it starts increasing uh, fast. Huh? Okay, yeah. So we have now seen one simple algorithm for uh, Bayesian network structure learning. Um, and it turns out that this is still a field uh, of ongoing research because uh, these algorithms are not yet really satisfactory. And there are many, many different 
um, methods are being used to solve this problem. For example, the EM algorithm, which is a very popular and actually simple algorithm. We will see the EM algorithm in the next chapter, in the next section, which is clustering. Um, yeah. Then Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, Gibbs sampling. Uh, so these are popular methods in constructing Bayesian networks. Then there is, I mean, the, uh, he, these two are two systems um, with Bayesian networks. I already mentioned Hugin, which is a very powerful system, but it also doesn't have a good uh, network structure learning algorithm. And then, for example, there is space there. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Next section, the naive Bayes classifier. So we, we continue with learning Bayesian networks, but as we have seen, this is a hard problem and it's not yet uh, really solved. Uh, and that's why we now simplify the, the network structure even more. Yeah? Uh, what we now do is we will um, assume all variables to be independent. But let's start with the, with the base formula. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, this is, this is um, the formula, how it looks like for a diagnosis application. It may be medical diagnosis as we had it in LexMed, or it may be some technical diagnosis uh, problem. Yeah, for example, I had a couple of years ago, maybe five, six years ago, I had a diploma student who did, uh, she did her diploma thesis with uh, Hewlett Packard. And uh, so th she worked in a project where they did automatic uh, diagnosis of uh, printer problems. Huh? Um, so a couple of symptoms, I mean, yeah, this was an expert system. They worked on an expert system for um, second level support. So uh, suppose you call Hewlett Packard because your printer doesn't work anymore and then the person on the line will ask you some questions whatever, uh, does it print anything or does it print an error message and so on. And these are the symptoms and based of these uh, symptoms um, you want to know uh, what, is, what is the problem. Huh? So, with the, this, so this here is the diagnosis. Huh? Um, so, and, and what you want to know is the probability for some diagnosis given the symptoms from the customer. That's what you want to know, but what you have is the other way around. So, I mean, these guys at Hewlett Packard, they can do statistics with their printers and given some uh, problem of the printer, they can uh, count the probability or estimate the probability for the symptoms. So that's what they have and the prior probabilities and with the base formula one can compute this. Yeah? Um, okay, but if we use the base formula naively we would have extremely, we would need to exactly do this extremely many of these conditional probabilities which is not realistic. Yeah? Uh, so in case of LexMate, for example, that would be 20 million uh, probability values, uh, which we don't have. Okay, and now we assume that all symptom variables, S1 through Sn, are conditionally independent given our diagnosis. Huh? And conditionally independent is this formula. Huh? So we can just uh, split up this complex uh, probability into a product of the pairwise conditional probabilities. And now if we do this in our formula, um, we get this. So this term here splits up into a product. Huh? Yeah. 
Um, and now what we do is, I mean, we finally have to select what is the diagnosis. Yeah? And this diagnosis variable B may have k different ver uh, values. And now I want to I <coughs> compute the probabilities for value B1, value B2, up to BK. And then I select, I select this, the, the value BI uh, with maximum probability. Huh? Yeah, because this is the diagnosis with highest probability. That's what we do. Okay, so um, we compute argmax of this conditional probability which we have here. So we just replace this right hand side in here and uh, that's what we get. But we, we throw away the denominator. We don't need the de denominator anymore. Why? Because it is a constant factor in this formula. I mean, we, c we could write the denominator, but it wouldn't change anything because the denominator does not depend on this variable i. Look, here we have just the probability for all symptoms to occur. But the symptoms, they are constant. They do not, the symptoms are the, really the problems that my printer has. It doesn't print anymore and, and so on. Huh? And they do not depend on the, on the diagnosis, so I can just omit it. And that's the formula, the naive, so-called naive base formula. Um, and as you can see, the whole algorithm is very simple because, look at this, we only need these simple pairwise conditional probabilities. Huh? Um, so when they do research about these printer problems, they just have to, to count uh, how many does, with a certain diagnosis, suppose printer doesn't do anything, no LED is on, um, and, and then they, they just have to, uh, to count uh, how often do I have this symptom and that symptom and that symptom and so on. Yeah? Okay, yes, and let's look at this graph. Uh, in case of the LexMate uh, application, uh, this is the structure of our Bayesian network now. Yeah? Um, so, take two variables. Here may be the age and uh, the rebound tenderness here, Abwehrspannung. We just have the directed edges from the diagnosis to the variables. And this means these two variables are conditionally independent given the diagnosis. So we don't have these uh, edges anymore out there. So the, the network structure is just a star. And that's the, the property of the naive base algorithm. Huh? So we simplify the structure of our Bayesian network to be a star. Of course, this assumption is not always fulfilled. When we talked about LexMate, we have seen that it is not good to use this assumption because then the results are much worse. And actually, it can be shown if you use if, uh, yeah, this independence assumption of all our symptom variables given the diagnosis is equivalent to using a linear score. And linear scores are the simplest uh, thing we can do. And we have also seen that a linear score on LexMate would be much worse than our LexMate system. 
So, of course, you may ask now, why does he show us this uh, when it's so bad? And, uh, and there is a particular reason. The reason is that there are applications where these naive Bayesian networks uh, give uh, excellent performance. And I will show you such an application in a few minutes. Yeah, okay, yeah. So let's look at our LexMate uh, network here. And if we look at our CPTs, I mean our CPTs, they are quite simple. We do have a CP, CPT for the diagnosis, um, for, the, for the prior probability, and then we have this, these conditional probabilities. Probability, for example, let's start here for LUCO7, given uh, the diagnosis. Yeah? So maybe we look at this. P of LUCO7 given the diagnosis. Um, and how many values does this have? I mean, the diagnosis has four values, and uh, this variable has seven values. So what we get is the number of independent um, values here is uh, six times four. Because, I mean, I always can omit one of these values because the sum uh, for, for a given value here, um, the sum over all the seven values has to be one. Yeah? So you can omit one, and we have six times four values. And that's how this formula here starts. It starts with six times four plus five times four, and so on. Yeah? Yeah. Ah, yeah, okay. And maybe you ask yourself why we have 10 times 1 times 4. Uh, the reason is that we have quite a number of binary variables. And uh, I guess it's uh, 10 binary variables. And for each, all the binary variables, the number of entries in the CPT is 1 times 4. And th that's what we have 10 times. Yeah, so this should be five variables. One, two, three, four, five. Yes, okay. And then there is, oh, and then we have this one here. Let me see, why do we have a one here? Oh, that's a good question, because actually for the diagnosis, we should have three values. So I'm, I'm not quite sure whether this one here is correct. Maybe it should be a three. I will check. <coughs> On which page are in the book are we? Okay. Oh, this is the... I guess it's a German book. Okay, I already mentioned all this. Um, yeah, okay, yeah. So let me say a few words about <laughs> how these probabilities are being estimated. In principle, it's a simple thing. Yeah? So for example, uh, I mean, I need to know all these conditional probabilities for symptom I be having a value X given our uh, diagnosis uh, has the value Y. Let me look here. Yeah. Um, and that's, I mean, that's the definition of our conditional probability. So we just count the number of these occurrences and divide it by the number of these occurrences. Yeah? Um, okay, and now suppose this conditional probability for some two given values x and y is 0 0.01. Yeah? 
based on 40 training cases um, with B equal Y. Huh? Um, and now, I mean, the number of training cases typically is finite, I mean, and often it's a small number. Huh? And so this value is 1%. Huh? Suppose this is the real probability which I would get if I would use infinitely many training samples. But now, I do have only 40 training cases. And if I have only 40 training cases and the probability is 1%, that means 1 out of 100 cases um, would be true, would this be true? And then that means in 40 training cases with high probability, I would find zero cases. And then I would estimate this probability as being zero. Okay? Um, and this is wrong. This is wrong because the real probability is greater than zero. I mean, you could say, okay, but that doesn't matter because the real probability is quite small. Yes, it does matter. And why does it matter? Um, it does matter because in our uh, in our naive Bayes formula, let's look at the formula back here. In this formula, here we have the product of all these conditional probabilities. And as soon as one of these conditional probability values is zero, the whole product is zero. Huh? The whole product is zero, so the argument of this maximum is uh, zero. So this one argument is zero, and therefore um, this value B i will not be chosen. Uh, and this this really depends on. I mean, this is just by random chance, uh, depending on whether this. Um, on whether we have seen one case to get a probability greater than zero or we have not seen a case and then it's zero. So it really depends on random choice uh, which class we would select. Huh? Yeah. So look, if for B equal Y we may get a zero, for B equals Z, we may get a value which is slight, slightly greater than zero, and then of course we would select Z, even though the real probability for B equals Z may be smaller than this one. Huh? So we get uh, really bad results. Huh? Um, and what can we do to avoid uh, getting such a zero, even though uh, even if there is uh, the probability is not zero. Huh? Um, yeah, we have to use a different formula for estimating such conditional probabilities. So now, I mean, this is the formula to estimate a conditional probability. Huh? Um, and, and let's call this here NAB. NAB is the number of samples in my training data where A is true and B is true. And NB is the number of samples where B is true. And now, look, why do we get a zero here? Of course, because this NAB is zero. Huh? So, and that's the problem. If NAB is zero, we get a zero as, as a result. And now we replace this formula by a new formula. Huh? And look in this new formula. Um, we add a term m times uh, p here. Huh? So if, if this term is zero, then there is this term remaining. <coughs> and uh, I mean here, 
we have uh, the, the, the crucial point is we add this P and this P is P of A it's the probability for our for observing A huh? so the probability for observing A and this A corresponds to our symptom it's the a priori probability for observing the symptom huh? and this can be estimated much better because we will have more samples because only one variable occurs so if we have a good estimate for P of A for this prior probability then we would add this P here huh? um, and now we have such a factor M I mean we could use in the simplest case we could use M equal 1 huh? um, yeah we could use M equal 1 um, or we could use an M which is greater than 1 suppose we would use a really huge M uh, like M uh, 10 power 6 then we would more or less neglect our real count uh, for the value we, we actually want yeah? so then we, we just have look suppose this M is very large then we can act like this and uh, we get what do we get then so we then get P of A given B is equal to so if M is large then this probability is approximately equal to P and P is P of A and what does this equality mean yeah so this is we assume the variables A and B are independent huh? uh, so that's I mean that makes our uh, naive base assumption even more extreme so all variables are independent I mean this is this is not really helpful because that would mean I just don't have to look at my variables huh? they are not relevant huh? um, of course I mean for our conditional probability we just use the prior so then we don't need an expert system anymore okay and if I use a small m <coughs> then the influence of this P is very small but at least it helps us avoiding uh, this problem of having uh, a zero here uh, and also of course in the denominator if the um, um, if the probability uh, or if this the the number of samples for B which is our our diagnosis variable is uh, zero then we would uh, even get a zero in the denominator which is not nice either yeah. okay yes I mean this is I showed you this because this formula is not only interesting for naive base networks it is interesting always when you when you do do estimate conditional probabilities based on small sample sizes yeah? because then you may get a zero in the enumerator or in the denominator and to avoid these zeros we just add the prior probability here yeah okay yeah and uh, this M this M uh, parameter here it's uh, it is called the equivalent sample size huh? look here I mean this NB is a number of samples uh, the number of times I observe B and I just add 
a number here. If this is one, I just add one sample. Huh? And so it's, yeah, it's, it's obvious that this is called a sample size. Okay, yeah, so now we, we know the naive base algorithm. Um, and now we go into this favorite application of naive base, which is text classification. Huh? Um, and, and one application of text classification is spam filters. And many spam filters are based on naive base classifiers. Um, and yeah, it actually turns out that uh, these naive base spam filters are extremely good, surprisingly good. Huh? Um, yeah. And what do we do in a spam filter? The naive base algorithm learns to separate um, spam mails from desired mails. Um, or we could also, I mean, uh, not only use it for spam filters, for example, in, uh, in, in blogs or any, any online uh, discussion forums, um, quite often the provider wants to delete undesired uh, postings, maybe with extreme political content or uh, right-wing radical postings. They want to delete all these and uh, because or if the, the, the traffic is high, they want to do this automatically, for example. Yeah, detecting websites with criminal content, um, or yeah, and also many, uh, many uh, news agencies, uh, they want to to use crawlers on the web uh, that search uh, through uh, large amounts of full text and just uh, classify full text documents in being interesting or not interesting. Or for example, for us users uh, using a mail client, I would be happy if I would have kind of a secretary that filters all my mails into those which are interesting for me and those which are not interesting for me. Huh? And uh, naive base could be used for this purpose. Okay, yeah. Of course, we need training data when we want to train our spam filter. Huh? So uh, initially, the user has to classify a large number of emails into desired and spam mails. Huh? And then the filter is trained, um, and this procedure is repeated uh, infinitely often um, <coughs> because maybe the, the type of mails that arrive changes um, or new spams occur and so on. Okay, yeah. <coughs> now let's look at an example. So I, I just in the following I used this, uh, this text. Huh? I used such example text like this. And then I classify a text as, uh, as I for being interesting and not I for not interesting. Uh, um, and uh, I use a database of such text, uh, chunks of text. And now, of course, the question is, which attributes should be used? The classical method would be we would now start thinking about some features of the text. So we would define a vector of features of our text. Maybe we take the length of the text, the number of characters in the text as, as feature number one, and what could we, what, uh, what other features could we use about a text? Oh, that's a good question. Maybe we could use the average length of the words in the text. Maybe a more academic text would have um, a higher average word length. I don't know. 
And we could think of a couple of other features, but that would be, we would have to do this manually, and that's not so easy. Now what Naive Base does, Naive Base um, uses for all words that occur in my text, so maybe this text consists of 200 words, I don't know. Huh? And that would mean, so if the length of the text is 200 words, then I would use 200 features for each word that occurs in the text. So this is feature number one, feature number two, feature number three, and so on. Huh? So, uh, yeah. And the value of feature number one would be V, and of feature number two is May, and so on. I mean, this, this looks like kind of extreme uh, overfitting, because we have so many features, and then the model would get a very complex structure. Um, yeah. But yeah, let's, let's look at the formulas. I mean, here we have our naive base formula. So the probability for our text being interesting, uh, given our input symptoms, and now these input symptoms or features are all the words. So n is equal to the number of words in the text. And this is our naive base formula the prior probability for the class, interesting and not interesting, times the product of all our conditional probabilities. And here we have some fixed constant, which is, was actually the denominator of our formula. But because it's a constant, we can just omit it. OK, so this is uh, for i, and we have the same for not i. Not, not interesting text. Uh, oh yeah, and here you see it's 113 words in the above example. So for this example text, for this example text, we get P of I given S1 through Sn is P of I times P of S1 equal V given I and so on. But why does it say 107? Um, yeah, okay, yeah. Um, because, let me see, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know why it says 107 here. Oh, so maybe this is a translation error. Yeah, this is a translation error. I guess in the German book, we had a little bit slightly different text. Um, yeah, so in the, in the English book, it's correct. It's P113 here. And was that? Shit. But, but still, I ask myself why this is should, because in our text, the last word is tried. Should be tried. So I guess this should, should be tried. <laughs> yeah. Um, also here, here we have, if a word occurs uh, twice or more often, 
it really occurs more often. But we will immediately simplify the formula, uh, you will see. Yeah? But let me, let me make a remark here. Okay, so we get, we, we compute this product for which gives us the probability for the text being interesting given this text and this is the probability for the text being not interesting and that's the, the interesting question we compute these two probabilities and then we decide for the class with the higher probability uh, that's, that's really simple uh, and now we can, we can, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. I mean, here you again, you, you see, what we need is um, these conditional probabilities. Let's go back, yeah. Um, so you see, we have the probabilities for the words given the class. That's what we need here. And we need the priors for the two classes. That's all we need uh, to compute our class probabilities. And now, um, now we make an even stronger assumption. Now, in addition to the naive base assumption, we assume that these conditional probabilities do not depend on the position in the text. Our variables are actually the position in the text, yeah? but now we assume it does not uh, depend on the position in the text. Look, for example, in our text, oh, that looks like it was the German text too, was it? S61, S69, and S86. Yeah. So suppose at uh, position 61 and 69 and 86, we have the word and in our text. Uh, um, and now we assume that the probability for an and occurring at some position does not depend on the position. Uh, if it does not depend on the position, then these uh, three probabilities are the same. And I guess, I mean, this assumption is quite realistic because, uh, I mean, could you say that in an interesting text the word and occurs at some position more frequently than at some other position? Yeah, maybe the first word in the text uh, uh, is unlikely to be an and. Uh? But and on any other position in the text, uh, it may occur or it may not occur with the same probability. So I guess this is quite realistic. Huh? Um, and so if we assume this, then we can simplify our naive base formula even more because now uh, these P of Wi given the class Look, now we don't have the position in the text. We just, our features are now the, the different words that occur in the text. So I do some statistics and now suppose, um, how many would it be in our example? I guess it was Oh, it's not written here. Suppose in our text we have 80 different words, then we, uh, we only have uh, this L here is the number of different words which then would be 80, which would be smaller. Uh, and now we, we take these probabilities for a certain word occurring in an interesting text and we take it to the power of the occurrence. So if the word and occurs three times, then this and I would be three. Okay, yeah. So this is a very simple formula. Um, and we compute the same for non-I 
and uh, take the maximum. Yeah, so that's how a an, an, uh, naive uh, Bayes text classifier works. And uh, yeah, you, you, know, you know now uh, how to implement a naive Bayes spam filter. Yeah, and uh, results, the results are really surprisingly good. Yeah? Um, there are, there are uh, two well-known uh, spam filters, let's say kernels of spam filters, uh, or algorithms being used in spam filters, which are basically naive base, uh, maybe with some optimizations about how they count the word frequencies, and one is DSPAM and one is CRM114 and they achieve a correctness of about 99.99% uh, which is really good. Uh. But I mean when you have a, sp uh, a spam filter and it would have a correctness of 70% that wouldn't be too good because suppose you get 100 spams per day then you would still have 30 spams per day. Yeah? So you really want to have uh, not many uh, spams. So you, you, at least I would like to have a correctness of uh, way above 90 percent, maybe 99 percent at least. Uh? But I mean these are extremely good. Um, yeah, I, I once uh, was the supervisor uh, of a student who did his uh, diploma thesis on uh, he built a filter for filtering mails in such an online forum uh, and uh, so his uh, results were in about that range okay yeah I mean that's that's now for the moment enough about supervised learning algorithms. Uh, so supervised learning algorithms are algorithms where we need classified input data. Uh, now maybe just uh, just go back to the uh, the text classification. What we need is for training I already mentioned if we want to train our spam filter we need classified emails. So before we start training our spam filter, the user must classify his mails into good mails and spam mails. Otherwise, uh, training does not work. Huh? And that's what we call supervised learning. Because before the learning, the user has to deliver classified training samples. Otherwise, it does not work. Huh? That's uh, supervised learning. And now we come to unsupervised learning. And one type of unsupervised learning is clustering. Yeah? So now suppose we do have uh, training data which are not labeled. So for example, in the text classification, we just have text. We have a bunch of different texts and nobody tells me which one of these texts are interesting and which are not interesting. So nobody tells me for each one of the texts whether they belong to this class or to that class. And the question is, is it possible for, our, for some algorithm to automatically find the different classes? And that's what we call clustering. Let's look at, an, at such an example. Um, these examples, oh, maybe we have it here. Yeah, okay, we don't have to draw it. Suppose we have a two-dimensional uh, space. Two variables, x1 and x2. And now we draw our samples in this two-dimensional space. And suppose we have three classes, this class, this class, and this class, which are clearly separated here by a region 
where the density of our data is small and here by such another separating region then it might be possible to automatically find these so-called clusters and the techniques are called clustering that we use yeah and as you can see um, finding these clusters may be possible if, uh, if it looks like this but suppose there are some other samples lying around like that then it's no longer possible to automatically find such a separating um, line no? and it may be even worse yeah now let's draw a new picture um, suppose we have one cluster and another cluster yeah and maybe here we get some of the other class too now if we would use clustering here in this example we would find such a separating line and we would maybe say this is class 1 and this is class 2 which is extremely bad then huh? uh, so I mean what clustering does is it finds clusters and that's it and only if we are really lucky the clusters correspond to classes in our data um, but in, in many applications it's interesting to do clusters huh? uh, to, to find clusters and to do clustering okay yeah let's look at an example where clustering is interesting um, whenever you use Google you type in some text and Google finds lots of documents M uh, quite often more than a million hits and now of course I mean Google con uh, has a lot of intelligence to order your hits and quite often uh, the first few hits are the most interesting for you huh? um, but suppose you input this word Mars then you would actually get two clusters of hits the one hit uh, type is about the planet Mars and the other type of hits is maybe about the chocolate bar Mars and quite probable you're interested only in one of these two classes huh? but of course Google doesn't know which one of the, two, uh, of the two classes you are interested in I mean you could of course add a second a second uh, word or a third word if you would add chocolate bar uh, then everything is clear or if you would add planet then also but suppose you only enter Mars and then you would get two clusters of fits the one cluster with the, the planet subject and the other cluster about the chocolate bars but unfortunately Google does not separate these two clusters huh? even though there are already techniques for text classification with additional clustering um, and I mean I know a company in Munich they already developed all the technique uh, for doing the clustering on search engines and they, they even offered it to Google via as far as I know three different channels they, they, uh, they talked to the top managers didn't get a response they talked to the immediate intermediate management and they talked to the, the really the technicians and no response no interest from Google 
but I mean they are so big and so rich and powerful they don't need the state of the art techniques huh? um, I mean it's really unfortunate that we don't have it in the search engines now because it's not too difficult and the technique is available but due to some reason Google doesn't want to offer it to the customers um, I mean it would be really helpful if you would see okay there is this one cluster uh, and you have the the sorted hits and the second cluster with the sorted hits okay that, that's an application where you, where you see it would be really helpful to have a, to apply a good clustering algorithm okay yeah yeah and what's very important the teacher is missing we just take our raw data without a class label um, and the goal is to find accumulations of data um, yeah and what's very important is of course how you compute the distance between two points I mean that's actually the basic uh, here these two are close uh, close together and these are farther apart and that's how we can find uh, class boundaries okay now let's look at distance metrics the Euclidean distance is a well-known distance metric for computing the distance between two points or uh, I mean we could uh, the first thing to make it simpler is to omit the square root why don't we need the square root it doesn't change anything if we just omit the square root in the Euclidean distance why that's it thank you yeah um, we just want to compare distances look here I mean it may be it's interesting to, uh, yeah uh, we want to know whether this distance is smaller than this distance yeah? and this um, smaller relationship um, is not changed if I apply a strictly monotonic function yeah? and uh, I mean the square root is strictly monotonic that's very important if this would be the sign you couldn't omit it because it's not strictly monotonic yeah? but because the square root is strictly monotonic we can just omit it as long as uh, our algorithm is based only on comparing distances yeah? we could make it even simpler by uh, deleting the, the square here and using uh, just the absolute value of the difference uh, but I mean this this is not uh, no longer equivalent now we have a different metric which is the Manhattan distance we already know this from our eight parcel example um, or we could make it even uh, simpler by using the maximum norm which is among our components of the vectors we just use the component with the maximum distance and there are many other distance metrics uh, yeah this one is also interesting the normalized scalar product yeah? um, this is for vectors so suppose we have uh, we, we talk about vectors in two-dimensional space our vectors they are all fixed in the origin and so maybe this is vector number one and uh, this is vector number two so this is our x and this is our y vector um, and now the, the scalar product of two vectors um, it is yeah, the scalar product is kind of the projection of the one vector onto the other vector yeah? um, and now if we normalize this, uh, this scalar product then we get a normalized projection um, and this is 
Oh, do I remember the formula? Um, so the scalar product of x times y is proportional to the cosine of the angle between these two vectors. Huh? Um, and therefore, I mean, yeah, suppose our second vector is the angle is very small and then we would say, okay, these two vectors, they are quite similar. Huh? And of course it now depends on whether the length of our vector is relevant or not. If the length is, is relevant, then maybe we would not divide by the, the, uh, the length of the vectors and we would use the not normalized Kähler product but if the length of our vectors is not so relevant and we just want to know the angle between the vectors and we would say if the angle is zero then the scalar product should be, should be large and if the angle is 90 degrees then the scalar product is zero because the cosine of 90 degrees is zero yeah so and so orthogonal vectors are as far from each other as they can be yeah, so this is quite interesting as a, a metric, a distance metric for vectors. Um, yeah, okay, and uh, um, so if the, the two vectors are equal, then the scalar product has its maximum, and if they are 90 degrees, then uh, its minimum. So we have to use the inverse of the uh, normalized scalar product as a distance metric. Yeah. And that's quite common, uh, especially in text classification. Yeah. Oh, do we have this? Um, yeah, no. Okay, yeah, let me show you how this scalar product of texts works. Um, let's look at the scalar product of two different texts and suppose we do have a vocabulary a certain vocabulary suppose in our typical texts 1000 different words occur huh? and in this case we compute vectors of length 1000. So then the vector contains typically many zeros and maybe here a one and then here a one again and then many zeros a one okay so this would be the x vector times And now maybe we have a zero here, a one, a zero, and then at this point we would have a zero again, and here a one, a zero. Okay. And now computing the scalar product, um, yeah, suppose these two are in the same in the same position and these two too then the scalar product would be two now what does our scalar product do it just looks whether these two texts have at the same position the same word if the texts would be identical then the scalar product would be equal to the length of the text. Huh? And the more different these texts are, the smaller this scalar product becomes. This is a, a classical uh, distance metric for texts. And 
it's easy to compute. Of course, you wouldn't implement it with this classical scalar product formula. Why not? Why wouldn't you implement it by just multiplying these two vectors? Um, yes, it would depend on the length of the text, but I wouldn't worry so much about this because we could divide, divide it by the length of the text finally. Huh? No, the reason is that in typical texts, um, almost all entries in the vector would be zeros. Huh? So it's a, a very sparse vector. Huh? It's a vector of length 1000, but in the, in the actual text, maybe only 100 of uh, these 1000 words occur. 100 different words, maybe even only, only 30 words would occur. So it's, it's a very sparse vector. So that means in this product, yeah, look at this example. Out of uh, 1000 entries, only two would match. So the result is two. So the, most of the multiplications would be zero times something. So most of the, of the uh, individual results would be zero. And we don't have to compute all these zeros times something. Yeah? Uh, that's useless. So what we would do is we would scan the two texts. And whenever two words match, we would increase our counter by one. That's what we would do. And that's, of course, much easier than first filling, filling up this vector and then filling up this vector and then do the whole useless multiplication. OK. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's what I just explained now. And now let's look at uh, clustering algorithms. Of course, clustering is not only useful for text classification. We can use it for anything. We can use it for image classification, whatever. Huh? Um, yeah. Now, this first uh, algorithm is the so-called k-means algorithm. Um, and we need to know the number of clusters in advance. Huh? So we can, if we apply k-means, we can, we have to fix our k. So we can separate our data into, for example, two classes. Then we would have k equal two. Um, yeah, and how does it work? So we, we initialize our cluster centers. What is the cluster center? It's, yeah, it's kind of the center of gravity, or, I mean, it's, here it would be like that at such a point, and here it would be like that. It's, uh, I mean, it's the mean. It's, it's uh, the arithmetic mean of all these vectors and of all these vectors. Huh? Um, but because initially when we start the algorithm, we don't know the clusters. We don't, we don't have any clusters. So what we do initially, we put some, some random points as our cluster centers. That's what we do uh, to initialize our cluster centers. And then we, we iterate over these two steps. Yeah? We classify all data to its nearest cluster midpoint. And then we recompute the cluster midpoint. But let's look at an example. So here we have uh, our data samples. And initially, these data samples all would have the same color, so they are just of one class. And now we randomly initialize our um, cluster centers. Yeah? Um, Yeah, suppose we initialize them like this. Yeah? And now what we do is we, um, yeah, we assign to each data point a class. 
So here we have uh, this, this is this point, this center defines the black cluster and this center defines the gray cluster. And now we assign all data points to the closest cluster center. Um, so what actually happens is we could draw the straight line between these two points which would be this line here yeah. and then we take the um, oh, what's that in English? Mittelsenkrechte um, which is this so the orthogonal line in the middle of this line and this then is the separating hyperplane for our uh, for these two cluster midpoints we don't look at the data points we just look at the cluster centers and then this line separates our two classes and that's why these points are now colored in gray and these points are colored in black so this is the first iteration of our algorithm and now what we now do is we now recompute our cluster centers. So what we do is we take the black class and take the average, uh, the mean vector which is here and from the gray class it's here. And now we iterate again. We do the same game again. So draw this line here, take, um, yeah, take the Mittelsenkrechte which is, I guess, yeah, should be here like, like this. Yeah. And now we, we, we would assign this point and this point to the gray class, which actually happens here. And now we iterate again. And what we see, and that's quite nice, already after four iterations, it converges. And we do have the two classes. Yeah, and it doesn't look too bad for these training, for these data. Yeah. Um, that's the idea of our algorithm. Um, and The result, the resulting set of clusters depends on the initialization. For, not always, not always. Sometimes it's stable, it does not depend, but there are example data sets where the result depends on our initial uh, cluster starting uh, points. Yeah, okay. But yeah, we should finish now. Thank you.